Okay, so um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to open this session um, on uh, recent trends in geometric analysis. Um, looking forward to it. So our plenary speaker for the session and our first speaker is Professor Guafong Wei from UC Santa Barbara. Um, Professor Wei <coughs> has worked on a broad range of problems in differential geometry, um, but is particularly well known for major contributions to the study of manifolds with um, positivity type conditions on the Ricci curvature, including negativity. But so, <laughs> um, and then uh, some recent focus has been on the study of Laplacian spectrum and especially on fundamental gap conjectures. And that leads into today's presentation talk, which is uh, the title of which is Fundamental Gap Estimate in Hyperbolic Spaces. Thank you, uh, Professor Gao, for the introduction. Okay, so first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizer for the invitation and also, you know, amazingly transferred the conference online. I think it's uh, very smoothly and organized. So uh, maybe uh, instead of the Bay Area, the beautiful, uh, maybe in this talk, if you're bored, hopefully you can enjoy. Um, yes. You can enjoy the uh, Santa Barbara view in my background. <laughs> Santa Barbara Beach. Okay. All right. Now let me uh, start. So, from time to time, I hope uh, uh, you can message the questions and also from time to time, I will uh, pass for questions in this case. So, I would like to present a fundamental gap estimate for convex domains. So this is a, a recent uh, joint work with the uh, first uh, Dai, He, and Sato, and one in some uh, various uh, subsets. And also recently with uh, uh, Bonn and the Clarkberg, Stanku, Wen, and the Wheeler. So the, all the papers are on the archive, so some are published. So these are the recent two ones which are uh, in the archive, which are listed here. Okay, also actually today I am uh, trying a first software. Hopefully that works out. Okay, uh, so the plan of the talk is first I'll give the uh, introduction to the fundamental gap and uh, uh, then give some uh, fundamental gap estimate for convex domains on the Euclidean space and the sphere. <clears throat> then we will move to the more recent work, it's, which is uh, convex domains on the hyperbolic space and I'll give a sketch of the proof and hopefully end with uh, posting some questions in the subject. Okay, so first recall the eigenvalues of Laplacian for any uh, you know, bounded domain, we can consider the uh, eigenvalue equation of Laplacian in the following. So in this expression, uh, my Laplacian for Rm, it's really just as a derivative, second derivative. In Rn, my Laplacian is just as a, all the second derivative square. So therefore, I need a negative sign here to make sure that the eigenvalues are actually non-negative, <clears throat> namely greater or equal to zero. So the general boundary condition we consider is a, a Dirichlet one, which vanishes at the boundary, or the uh, Neumann one, which the normal derivative vanishes at the boundary. In both cases, the eigenvalues are discrete. 
have finite multiplicity and go into infinite. <clears throat> so one of the difference is the first eigenvalue of Dirichlet is always positive, while the first eigenvalue Neumann is always zero. Okay. So there are really uh, many, many works in estimating the eigenvalues, especially the first uh, uh, non-zero eigenvalues, which are mu one and the lambda one, the first uh, non-zero ones too. <clears throat> so uh, one of the very basic technique, and it's also powerful, is the min-max characterization of the eigenvalues. Namely, the case eigenvalue is infimal of all k-dimensional subspace, then in the subspace, you take supremal of this Rayleigh quotient. So quotient of the derivative L2 norm and the function L2 norm. So take among all the function which is not equal to zero, satisfy the corresponding boundary conditions. So uh, in particular, we can see the first one let's say the Dirichlet case, the smallest eigenvalue is just the infimal of all the ratio value quotient for all functions, which is not zero. And second eigenvalues, uh, we take all the infimal, but the function which are perpendicular to the first um, eigenfunction, eigenspace, first one. So the rest of them, and we can keep going for each of the uh, eigenvalues have the characterization in this case. So at first thought so in this case, it looks like, which usually is true that getting an upper bound maybe sounds a little bit uh, uh, easier because what you need is a good test function. You put in, you get upper bound. But in order to get a lower bound, uh, then we need a bound for all the functions. But sometimes it's also very tricky to get up a bound too. Okay. So that's a, uh, and I list as a, what? I list as a first uh, uh, two eigenvalues as because in the talk, I'm going to mainly focus on the so called fundamental gap. Fundamental gap it's really the uh, difference of the first two eigenvalues. <clears throat> so one thing is that uh, we said the first eigenvalues are simple. So the next one is always bigger than the first one. So in both cases, so we're going to denote the gamma of the domain as a fundamental gap. It will be always strictly positive. Okay, so if we consider the third one, fourth one, maybe it's going to be zero because of the multiplicity in this case. So eigenvalues are, uh, you know, in quantum physics are really represent energy levels. So this uh, fundamental gap, you can think about if we want to excite from the ground state, the lowest level to next level, how much the uh, energy is. So which is, uh, you know, interesting both in mathematics and the physics. And then you can also consider uh, Schrodinger operators uh, more general instead of Laplace operators. So most of the time, I will just focus on the Laplace operators. <clears throat> so gamma of the domain is, we denote as fundamental gap. So to use this notation again and again. So the question we're going to uh, focus uh, today is trying to get some really good bond, up and the lower bound for the gap. Okay. So uh, most, I uh, will discuss both bond. Most of the time we will look at the lower bond, uh, but also upper bond in this case. <clears throat> so to illustrate the question, let me first start with a very simple example, the simplest one, namely when the space is just an interval. So in this case, uh, the eigen equation is just a, a ODE with a constant coefficient. We can solve then explicitly, write out the general solution. Then put in the, as we already assume lambda is greater or equal to zero. So that's the case. The exponential uh, does not, won't have a solution. So for Dirichlet boundary, if we put the boundary values, 
then we can find the solution, the constant C2 is zero, and the C1, uh, any constant, and lambda has to be k pi over d squared. <clears throat> so eigenfunction is really just as a uh, sign of k pi over d. <clears throat> now the object we interested, the fundamental gap, notice this number will come up again, is three pi squared over d squared. <clears throat> So everything can call it. Similarly, for Newman's case, uh, instead of sine, well, for the boundary, it's changed to cosine. But here, k is could be zero. So as in this, so first eigen function of Newman case, it's always just as a constant function. Okay. So therefore, in this case, the gap is just a pi over d square. <laughs> you can see. Okay, so actually it's uh, uh, interesting to study both cases, but Newman cases, the gap, it's easier because uh, the first eigenvalue, we said it's always zero. So in Newman cases, it's, it's just estimating the first non-zero eigenvalue. So uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the Newman case uh, in the talk. Rest of them, I will just uh, concentrate on the Dirichlet case. <laughs> Uh, which usually for the gap problem, it's uh, are harder because uh, both eigenvalues are not equal to zero. Okay, so that's the uh, um, question set up. Is any questions, comments so far? Okay. Uh, now let me uh, go to the some uh, results in these directions. So first case, let's consider, consider the convex domains which are in the Euclidean space. <laughs> so here uh, the question is a Schrodinger operator general and there's potential. So we assume, let's say, potential is convex. Okay. So in this case, first it's uh, observed by physicists Van der Berg uh, in the 80s, then later uh, Ashbaum, Ben-Gurion, and Yao. They conjecture that the fundamental gap with the potential is always big or equal to three pi square over d square. Here d is the diameter. That's what we use for the interval. So, and that's usually referred to the fundamental gap conjecture. <clears throat> So this uh, uh, conjecture, this three pi square of d square is optimal because uh, uh, you cannot be done any better because if we take v equal to zero and our domain, uh, we just saw that in the interval case, it's exactly that's the gap of the interval. And in high dimension, if we look at a very thin triangle, uh, make a thin, then, and with the length d here, then the diameter is almost, almost d, and this gap does approach uh, to 3 pi square over d square when the, uh, this rectangle becomes thin and the thin. So that's uh, an optimal thing uh, if can be proved. <laughs> so there's uh, uh, many works in these uh, directions. One of the first inferential work is uh, uh, by Singer Wan Yao Yao in 80s. <clears throat> so they first uh, obtain a lower bound, which is pi square over 4d square. So this is a still convex domain on Euclidean space. And uh, Yu and Zhong and Lin, they improved the bound with, so those, they use a uh, uh, gradient estimate of the eigenfunction, similar method to pi square over d square. And then, uh, so uh, Lavin, he uh, completely solved the, for the one-dimensional case. So in the one-dimensional case, for any convex the potential, obtain the optimal three pi square over d square. So for, for a while, that was uh, um, the result, usually a uh, little bit increment. But so finally, in 2011, 
Ben Andrews and Julie Clark book, they solved the fundamental gap conjecture showing that this is the, indeed is three pi square over d square. So they, uh, in the proof, they used a new method, say maybe we call it module of continuity to point the maximal principle. And so they also use the heat equation to get the estimate. Uh, then later, uh, Nhi, Lei Nhi, he used similar method, but instead of heat equation, he just used eigenvalue equation and got the same result. So that's for any convex domain with diameter d. And you can uh, hear Zhiqian Lu and Julie Rowlett in 2014, they studied the gap of triangles in the plane. In that case, you know, the gap actually they proved can be bigger, almost 2.5 bigger than the general lower bound. It's 64 over nine pi square over d square, okay. So there's uh, lots of things one can look at it. So right now I'm just focusing lower bound. Later on, I'll mention uh, upper bound quickly. Okay, so this uh, the lower bound. It's usually a uh, harder in this case. So that's a uh, uh, convex domain in Euclidean space. Then naturally we want to ask, what about on sphere? <clears throat> So that's a convex domain on sphere, the unit sphere. In this case, in the 80s, Li and Wan with similar method already obtained the bound, which is pi square over d square. Okay. In this case. <clears throat> then uh, recently, uh, in a joint work of myself with Xiu Sato, Li Li Wan, which uh, is published in JDG in the first work is we proved the same fundamental gap estimate. This is strict inequality, in fact. First, for dimension big or equal to three and diameter is less than pi over two. Uh, here, we uh, only also use eigenvalue equations, not heat equation. Then later, joint with He, we removed the diameter uh, restriction. So diameter just uh, it's convex, it's automatically less than pi, but dimension is still big or equal to three. Then in the end, uh, joint with Dai and uh, show, uh, this is archive date papers, we did all the dimensions. So maybe uh, for time we can explain why there's difference in the dimension because of the model case. Uh, Dimension two has to be taken out separately in this case. And this, this uh, work also works for all dimensions. Okay, so uh, here maybe I'll just uh, indicate idea of the proof, not go into in both cases on the Euclidean space and uh, on the sphere. The proof maybe is the idea in here Wait, can be divided into uh, three steps. Uh, first step is called trying to reduce to Newman. We said Newman actually it's a bit easier. So reduce the problem in some sense to the Newman case, namely by considering the ratio of the first two eigenfunctions. So phi one and phi two are the first two eigenfunctions. Oh, phi one, it's simple. Phi one is the first eigenfunction you can choose. It's a property that you can make it so that in the interior, it's always positive. So this is well-defined. Uh, even in the boundary, both of them vanish so that uh, still in the boundary, the so ratio is still uh, well -defined. The limit exists. So this W function is well-defined on the whole domain. Not only that, it satisfies this very nice Laplace equation such that the gap, it come out naturally here. So Laplace of W, and also it involves the log of the first eigenfunctions. So this is uh, somewhat like weighted Laplace. In this, uh, and with the eigenvalue now, it's exactly the gap we're looking for. And W now, it satisfies a Newman boundary condition. 
okay, which you can intuitively. So if you sh think W is nice all the way in the boundary, these two terms are nice. And this last term, because the phi one at the boundary is zero. So this is infinite. Now in all two, the equation makes sense. So this at the boundary, the uh, W has to vanish. So that's uh, intuitively saying W has to satisfy the Newman boundary condition. So this is a very general uh, in the paper of single one yaw yaw, it's already uh, used in this. <clears throat> so it does not require uh, any restriction uh, on the domain or on the space, can do it. Uh, second step, it's really here, it's a, a key step here to show that so since notice that this equation involves the log of the first eigenfunction. So we can think about, we want to prove some log concavity of the first eigenfunction. So which I won't state explicitly, but in particularly it shows that the log of the first eigenfunction is more concave than the log of the first eigenfunction of some model. So this is, uh, I can, so this is a one dimensional model coming from of the, um, you can choose the model, suitable model you need it into. So the real, the super law concavity contains more information than that. And earlier it's known that this one in, for example, in our ion sphere, that this is less or equal to zero much earlier. And that's in Yao and Singer's work. But this model you choose, actually, it's a strictly less than zero. So I would call this as a super log concavity because it's not just a, a log concave, but less or equal to something negative in here. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this part is quite involved uh, in the proof. In the, so it's a, a key part. Once you have second part, then assume second part then this is also general. You can get a gap comparison with just a rich curvature lower bound and this log super log concave assumption. Then you can show that the gap of the domain is big or equal to the gap of the model. The bar is the eigenvalue from the model. And you can estimate the model of the, uh, the model is actually greater or equal to three pi square over d square and put everything together, that's uh, kind of the proof. <clears throat> so this is a really a very rough idea. And we said in the second step, it's uh, quite involved. Actually, we see first one and third one, they're all very general actually. In the second step, uh, everything also works simultaneously for Euclidean space sphere and uh, uh, and for hy hyperbolic space also everything work except except one step okay just the one equality does not work so therefore uh, this is really for sphere and RM okay so maybe we can pass see if any questions yeah which is a, a fundamental gap estimate for domains on sphere and Euclidean space. Okay, so uh, no question. Then the so natural thing we want to ask is what about hyperbolic space? So when truly, uh, when we done this work on the sphere, that's first, uh, and I emailed to Ben Andrews, and that's the first reply, what about a hyperbolic space? And that's been, so that's, uh, I would like to, more recent work, we uh, got information on hyperbolic space. So first, let me review, there's not much gap on hyperbolic space, but there's two really uh, relevant, interesting work. First is she, back in 1989, showed that there's convex domain in the hyperbolic plane, such that the first eigenfunction is not log concave. Remember in the sphere and uh, uh, in Rn, 
we showed the first eigenfunction is not only log concave, but super log concave, okay? So that's not the case. Actually, it's even not quasi-concave, which is a weaker, uh, maybe. And there is uh, uh, some beautiful upper bound. So before we were always a lower bound, namely uh, for any domain in hyperbolic space, uh, the gap of the domain, it's always bounded by gap of a ball. This is a ball. And this ball, it's chosen such as that the first eigenvalue of the ball is equal to the first eigenvalue of the domain. So this is really, you can think about its second eigenvalue comparison. Namely, if the domain of the second eigenvalue is always smaller than the second eigenvalue of the ball, once you choose a ball, have the same eigenvalue. And the exactly same result also hold for, com uh, for domain in uh, Rn and a sphere that's proven by Ashbaum Bangoria in this earlier in this case. So, so that's the upper bound case. <clears throat> All right, so still we want to say, is, since it's not log concave, so the feeling is that, okay, well, maybe the gap, it's not a lower bound, it's not by three pi square over d square. And yes, that's the case. Uh, we recently confirmed that. So that's the joint work with uh, uh, the Doric, Julie, Alina, and Hein, and myself, and uh, Valolino. We started this project uh, in Women's in Geometry workshop uh, last year. So uh, we showed that there's convex domain in the hyperbolic plane such as that the gap is smaller than three pi square of d square. So this, uh, which is kind of expected in the construction, uh, we need the diameter kind of big, okay? And in the she's example, in we also estimated the gap is still bigger than three pi square over two d square. Okay, so at first uh, we still expect some kind of lower bound. Uh, said okay, what can, maybe it's not three pi square over d square, but maybe it's pi square over d square. Or, but uh, uh, recently, very recently, the same joint work after we look we found that actually there is no lower bound at all. <clears throat> Namely, we can show that for any diameter, any epsilon, we can, we can construct a convex domain or in any dimension with a diameter t, such as that the gap is smaller than epsilon of pi square over d square. Okay, so epsilon is arbitrarily small. <clears throat> So really, I think that explains why I was, when we do the proof of sphere, I was really wondering why it does not work for the hyperbolic space. And that's why it cannot work actually <laughs> in this case. <clears throat> okay, so that's, now let me uh, maybe uh, sketch the proof of this uh, uh, result, especially the last one, which of course covers kind of covers the first one. Okay, any questions? Okay, so construction, since this is a uh, uh, proven upper bound in this, all we need is a constructor domain. So the constructor the domain here, it's motivated from she's example. Okay, so for, just the illustration, I'll just concentrate on two dimensional case because the idea is exactly the same. So we look at this hyperbolic space with the up half plane model, and we're gonna use polar coordinate, except that the angle we use here is the angle from the y axis. So here is phi equal to zero on this ray. <clears throat> so then this is r is from uh, radial direction, phi is the angle, okay? With a up half plane model, so this metric. 
Then the domain we consider is in this uh, uh, picture. Basically, it's a kind of rectangular in R and the phi. So R is from one and e to the pi of uh, square root of mu. Mu is a parameter we're going to use. So mu is a positive constant. And in this work, later on, we're going to uh, let mu to be very big. When mu is very big, I is also close to one. So it's like this strip, we look at it. And the angle is from negative L to L. Okay, so this, so really this uh, uh, the shape we draw here. Maybe it's a stranger we put in here. Later on, we'll see why we put R this way, just to make later on the, uh, the notation easier, just to this one. So that's for the second result. Actually, in the first paper, the domain we concentrate is, so this is, later on, we're going to set that mu very big, so this is a very, very thin. But in the first paper, we construct the domain in the following way. It's more like this. Uh, so it's concentrated on the y-axis. It's still saying like this fan, but instead of uh, that as a radius, radial direction goes to like a zero, we let the angle directions, the L go to zero. And uh, that's, uh, we found the gap is less than uh, three pi r square over d square, but still have some lower bound, uh, especially when diameter is small. <laughs> So uh, for this, we're going to, now maybe let's look at a little bit of hyperbolic geometry. Oh gosh, I'm not sure actually, I, sorry. This is, I just downloaded uh, yesterday this software, so I'm not that familiar. Huh? Uh, looks good to allow me. So, okay, one thing we can hyperbolic geometry, let's say if we have like here, this SOCO direction, so SOCO we know that you're designating hyperbolic space. For the SOCO, so when I is fixed, then this di is zero, the length really only depends on phi. So one thing is that we can see that SP, these two SOCO is equal to RQ. The length of these two is the same. So that's uh, because we really use in the hyperbolic metric, okay, it's not the Euclidean metric. But if we look at the distance of the ray, namely that the angle fixed, phi fixed, so d phi is zero, okay, so let r change. Then it depends on cosine, so denominator is one divided by cosine square phi, so when phi equal to zero, it is the smallest. So therefore, the middle one, yeah, maybe I uh, erase what I wrote here. Then the middle one is a UT is less than PQ. <clears throat> so in some sense, this data, the middle distance, a little bit it's like the dumbbell in the Euclidean, you can think about the middle. And that's actually, uh, we'll see this gap, it may not have a bound. First indication of this in this case. Okay, so that's the domain. Another thing, okay, you can check that this domain is uh, convex, and because of the domain, it's really a rectangular in the variables, so it allows uh, separation of the variable to do computations. Okay, so that's it's really a convex domain. These two are geodesic, the side are convex in this case, all right. Okay, so while we want to estimate the gap uh, in terms of diameter, right? So this really, uh, we, what we want is, uh, uh, we need a diameter upper bound, which easily can be obtained, especially if we restrict, is a, we let mu big, then this is a, the width of the strip, if it's bounded, diameter should be bounded. In fact, we can get a very precise estimate on the diameter of the domain. Namely, the diameter of the domain, it's always going to be big or equal to, actually this, exactly, this is exactly, you can compute, it's the length of the uh, SQ.
It's SP actually, the notation. Namely, the circles we said. <clears throat> and when you thicken a little bit, it's going to be bigger. But whenever mu is uh, uh, bigger than some number, it can be controlled by this. So this can be diameter, can be precisely bounded from up and above, which is not hard. Uh, compute, uh, you can compute the space. Okay, so since the diameter is bounded above, now we want to show the uh, gap go to zero. All we need to show is the uh, eigenvalue goes to zero, the difference of the eigenvalue. Okay, so now let's look at the eigenvalue of the domain. As we said, we can do a separation of variables and put in. So then the radial direction is the first equation and the angle is the second equation. I maybe I shouldn't this I should put a more general constant here, the mu, maybe like C and C, but we'll see for our purpose, we can really just put on mu. Uh, okay. So let's say put a general constant. First equation is really a lot equation. You can solve them explicitly. So we can find the eigenvalue of the first equation is just k squared mu. And that's why we use this range a little bit right, different, weird maybe, so that we can look at the eigenvalue kind of simple, it's just a mu, okay. So we're interested in the smallest uh, eigenvalues, right? Mu is a prime, so we're going to choose k equal to one. So therefore we put a mu here, but whatever the constant you put here, this is the same constant here. So if it's, uh, uh, let's say, k square mu, namely like four mu, then you have four mu and the four mu. So together, and this lambda eigenvalue is the lambda here, so represented, so the parameter. So in order to get the first eigenvalue of the domain, of course, we choose the smallest eigenvalue of the first equation, so which is mu and put in, and then you get the, look at the first eigenvalue of the second equation, which I'm going to denote as lambda one of mu because it's going to depend on mu. So it's lambda one. That's the first eigenfunction of the domain. What about second eigenvalue of the domain? Well, there's two possibilities. One is just as a second eigenvalue of this equation, <clears throat> second equation here, or you take the first equation and you take the eigenvalue to be, you know, the next one, which is going to be four mu, four mu, and you put four mu here, then you look at the first eigenvalue of here, which I think of lambda one, four mu, it's the smallest of this. So it doesn't matter, it's always less or equal to this one. <clears throat> so in the end, so therefore the gap, we looking at it, it's always actually less or equal to the gap of this second equation here, which are parameter with mu. So we reduce the question really to just an estimate on the gap of an ODE with a parameter mu here. Okay. Any questions? The setup. So we have the domain and we know what the goal we want in this case. Okay, so really the key estimate is uh, we want to show, you know, the gap we're going to use the value quotient, it involves the first eigenfunction a lot. So the key in terms of picture we want is, we want to show the first eigenfunction, it looks like this one, this picture. This picture say you can choose any phi zero in here, then you show the maximum will be outside in between that, in between phi zero and L. First eigenfunction is going to be an even function. So it looks like uh, this. So namely, so the maximum, it will go to L, the end point as we go mu going to infinite. And as a middle part, we want to show it go to zero with precise, okay. Uh, rate needed. The so middle part, it goes to zero. So this function looks like this. It's far from log concave. It's not concave at all. It's not even quasi-concave. 
So once we proved this, actually we also recover she's uh, uh, result. Okay, this another construction of uh, examples that first eigenfunction is not quasi concave. Okay, so I just need to make everything here precise, exactly how it goes and uh, estimate, which uh, involve some uh, quite a bit of OD estimate. So let me hopefully. You still with me? Let me get the precise estimate. So we're going to estimate the gap using the value quotient. <clears throat> okay, as we said, the first uh, eigenfunction is uh, even. So second eigenfunction, we go into just uh, so this h1 is first eigenfunction, which is equal to this. The so second eigenfunction, we're going to use a test function. Psi times h1, okay, and this function psi, it's almost it's a step function except to go in the uh, the die, so everywhere is almost one, and but it's making this is odd function, so this psi phi one is perpendicular to h1, so it's a good test function, and this uh, this phi one we're going to choose is a very very small. Phi one is we have a phi zero on the top divided by mu, so eventually it's going to be uh, going to zero. So psi is a derivative. Well, it's everywhere it's going to be zero, but this part is a very big near zero. The psi derivative it's more like a one over mu, which could be very big. So that's why we need is h one going to zero pretty fast to control everything. Okay. So uh, we do. So in order to uh, really show precisely the picture of the first icon function we had, okay. So this equation we have is uh, uh, remember the equation of the uh, function. I thought we have here is here. Okay, to control the first icon function. Okay, so we first going to give estimate on the eigenvalue, first eigenvalues, then we go back, okay? So it's a uh, first uh, step, okay? So it's the first eigenvalue estimate, a lower and the upper bound, just as a, so because the function one over second has some control in this. So this part, we were just interested in mu is big, then it's bounded from above and the below, and then we see when mu is going to infinite, the first anchor function, it go, grows like a mu. So the limit goes to constant in this. So first icon function goes to infinite asymptotically like mu. So once we have this uh, first eigenvalue bound, then we can use a comparison. So first icon function, we call it this. So lambda is bounded up and above and second phi in this domain, you can also have a bond. So it's quite reasonable then we can bond the first eigenfunction. So have to notice that the usual comparison is initial equal to zero. Here we have derivative equal to zero. So we can control the eigenfunction in terms of the zero, the origin bonded from both sides by Cauch. And uh, here the C1 constant only depends on phi zero. You can do it for any fixed point. Phi zero, it's less than uh, the domain. <clears throat> okay, so that's, uh, uh, you know, if you have this bond, then it's uh, reasonable that's, uh, uh, using the stone comparison in this case. Okay, so while we want to show this uh, really H10, right, exactly behavior, so this is a relative. So H10, we can go back to the equation if we normalize H1, uh, so that the rally quotient is, is the denominator is equal to one. Then we can show the in the interval, the part, the middle part, okay, it's actually going to zero. This part is going to zero as mu going to infinite. So really somewhat like the picture so that 
So concentrated H1, it's you know, outside of phi zero in this case. <clears throat> if we normalize the Rayleigh quotient to be one, then the middle part is kind of small, can be showing it. Okay, so this combines the upper bound above, then we can show that H10, it really decays, actually even decay exponentially in terms of the mu. Okay, everything is fixed. And this constant is fixed. So H1 now, that's exactly what we want, nearby zero. So not only, is, well, if it's a zero, it's decays, then we had up and lower bound nearby in terms of H10. So really we have very good control on the first eigenfunction picture. And you can also get control on the, uh, also on the derivative. <clears throat> okay, so which is exactly the estimate we need. So summary from all the previous work, we can get this integral estimate. So mu one is, we said is like, uh, phi one is like one of mu, such is that this integral of the function is even you multiply mu square is still go, when mu going to infinite, so it's going to zero more faster than one over mu square. So that's the integral estimate we need. And we also need as a derivative, the derivative also goes to zero in this interval. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and that is the key, I think. Once you have these two estimates on the first eigenfunction, basically, now we can go back, write the Rayleigh quotient out. Uh, because of the function psi, remember psi is really constant, one and a negative one, it's exactly the same, and it's square. So everywhere canceled, so only thing left. Everything, all the terms, the interval is really from negative phi one to phi one on this small interval. <clears throat> so you can write the difference between phi one, psi phi one, and the derivative difference. And this is difference, but with a mu because of the, so everything is a difference. And this term D it's, well, lambda one is kind of big. So it's also the difference. So we can write the Rayleigh quotient, everything in terms of the difference between, in some sense, the first and second eigenfunctions. With the normalization, we normalize the, the first eigenvalue de denominator equal to zero. Okay, so now these two integral estimate really can show this uh, basically or integral this this is a uh, uh, bounded, and that's going to go to zero, and the worst term probably is uh, here, the derivative of the phi, phi the derivative um, remember the derivative it's like one over mu. And we have the square, and that's exactly what we need. We showed that mu square h1 square is still uh, going to zero. So the in the end, is you can show everything goes to zero. Uh, the four constant. So uh, that is a Rayleigh quotient, which is when mu going to uh, infinite, it's going to equal to zero. So uh, from here, let's go back. Conclusion is we know the eigenvalues is less or equal to the Rayleigh quotient, and that's uh, uh, the this part goes to zero as the mu goes to zero. Oh, sorry, mu going to infinite. Therefore, this goes to zero, and the gap goes to zero. But then, what we need is uh, uh, d square times gamma, it also goes to zero. Because the D is, uh, D is bounded when you, that's exactly what we need. So epsilon, mm -hmm. right. Okay, any questions? Uh, okay, so then maybe it's my turn to post some questions. So in this uh, subject, there are actually still lots of questions uh, one can ask. So let me just uh, give some examples <clears throat> possible. Uh, so for hyperbolic space, so basically we say 
for complex domains there is really uh, no lower bound, then you can ask what about a uh, hollow convex domains, which may be a more natural notion of convex domain for hyperbolic space actually. And we are working on it, have some uh, progress already. And you can ask. Also, you can ask about convex domains, for example, on CPM or even more general uh, manifold with just some curvature bound in this case. Um, but uh, surprisingly, uh, there's lots of work in Newman case, but very little in Jerry case. Now, instead of uh, Laplacian, uh, you can also consider the nonlinear so called P Laplacian for convex domain. <laughs> In uh, in sphere, in RN, or in or every uh, all the cases you can. So other questions. So there's lots of other questions you can talk about. Okay, is there questions? So uh, I could stop here, or maybe go and present. You know, in this uh, in the idea of the sphere or. Euclidean space, I can make maybe more precise what is a superlock concavity and what is a model and so on. Not sure. Uh, what's you have a couple of minutes, so that would be fine. Okay. So instead of here, we can. So that's a, a go back. As we said, lots of the result we do actually for works for any space with constant curvature. So remember the key is trying to compare the gap with the model, one dimensional model. And that's the one dimensional model you put to have symmetry, it's interval from negative pi d over two to d over two. So it's a second order with this 10K. So 10K may be kind of encoded, but let's say just to say K equal to zero is zero. So it's a very simple uh, model. You can compute explicitly. And for k equal to one, that's just as a tangent, that's it, okay. And the so k is negative, that's why there's a negative sign which mess up lots of things uh, in this case. So as we said, if k equal to zero, you can compute the first eigenfunction model. It's just a, a cosine because we put a negative d, so it's not sine, so it's cosine. And there's a log concavity here it's an active, uh, it's a second iterative, it's negative. So this is strictly less than zero, okay? Yeah. And later on, so this function, uh, because of symmetry, it's also even function and the derivative as zero is zero. So that is a, a model eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, which depends on the dimension, so the M here and the D and the curvature, so K. <clears throat> So then the key result, the superlog concavity uh, is uh, now can be formulated as a following. So in this part, so even though this can be any convex domain in here, this is a space with constant curvature K. So in the end, as I mentioned, the proof just one step does not work, which we need, we know K has to be great or equal to zero. <laughs> You can show that so-called, so, so this is kind of hard to, so first eigenfunction is, this you can think about, this is the first eigenfunction. So it's a long geodesic, you're given any two point X and Y, you make connect, it's convex by unique minimal geodesic. This is X, this is Y. You parameterized, so let's say the distance is D, and uh, you uh, parameterize, so this is D as a distance between X. You parameterize a geodesic so that it's negative D over two is X. This is uh, gamma of negative D over two. And this is gamma of D over two. So really, okay, that's what I mean here. It's, this is like the module of concavity uh, instead of just as a Hessian. Uh, this contains more information than, so this 
does imply that, as we mentioned before, it implies the hashing of log of the phi one is less than hashing of log of phi one bar. Phi is the here. It does not look like because the phi one, remember the derivative we said is equal to zero and the uh, parameter is. So the difference of these two points, the modular, it's less or equal to the modular of these functions. So this, and this usually it's uh, already negative. So that's a, uh, so proof is quite involved. So of course, so when k equal to zero, was, that's already done in Ben Andrew Clark book and Lay. So in this part, uh, to separately, uh, in the first part, we proved with some diameter restriction and later on we remove the diameter restriction. Okay. So then, yeah, I guess, oh, I already mentioned this part. So the gap comparison is showing that if you have this low concavity and you only need a rich curvature lower bound, then this is greater or equal to the model of the eigenfunctions in this case. Okay. So maybe I'll just give one indication why dimension two is different. Here, this is a model equation. And if we cho choose a change of variable, we can obtain to change it to this shrinking form. <clears throat> Notice that here, when m uh, equal to three, this term changes the sign. So uh, namely, when m big or equal to uh, three, uh, for this model, you can show that the gap is big or equal to three pi square of d square. But when n over two, actually the model is strictly less than three pi square over d square. So therefore in dimension two, we need another proof and that's in the joint work of the day a set away. So in these two dimension, we construct another model and do the same estimate. And in that case, the model is equal to three pi square of d square and gives uh, another proof. Yeah, okay. I think uh, I'll uh, stop here. So thank you. <laughs>